Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have our speakers in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. It is now my pleasure to turn this conference over to Jen Braun. Jen, you may begin. Thanks, Chantal. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. My name is Jen Braun, and I'm a Senior Program Manager with the American Hospital Association. Um, and welcome to the first AHA Team Training Webinar of 2018. I'm very happy to have you join us for our webinar on physician engagement and quality, safety, and team steps. Um, and just like everyone else across the country, it seems, I'm suffering from a cold as well. So please bear with me as I get through these next few slides, hopefully without a coughing attack. But um, before we begin, I'd like to go over a few rules of engagement. Um, so audio for the webinar can be accessed in one of two ways. So you can either dial into the conference line that you see in the notes section in the upper right portion of your screen. So if you dial in through your phone, please be sure to mute your computer speakers so you don't have double sound. Um, if, you want to, if you don't want to dial in through your phone, you can listen to the audio through your computer speakers. But please note that if you listen uh, through your computer speakers, that is dependent on your Wi-Fi and Internet connection. So if you're having any issues, I would suggest dialing in through your phone. If you have any questions for our speaker today, we encourage you to chat them in during the presentation in that chat box you see on the right side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, I will kind of sift through some of the questions and hold a Q&A with Dr. Nunez. You can also download the slides today in the files pod on the lower left side of your screen. This webinar, just so you know, is being recorded and archived, so if you have a colleague that was unable to attend or if you'd like to revisit this webinar, just know that that will be available to you and will be posted on our website within the next week or so. And then finally, we very much value your feedback on these webinars, so please keep an eye out uh, for an evaluation that will be sent directly to your email immediately after this webinar. As you hopefully are aware, we offer monthly webinars, typically the second Wednesday of each month at 12 p.m. Central Time. So our next webinar is on February 14th with Dr. Orrin Gutman from the University of Texas Southwestern. Uh, he'll be presenting on brain-based strategies to improve process improvement, deployment, and healthcare reliability. <laughs> Uh, just like all of our webinars, this one is free, and you can actually click on that register hyperlink that you see there on your screen, and it will take you directly to the registration page. Uh, we have also posted our course schedule on our website for 2018, so please feel free to take a look at the dates and locations that we have scheduled. Um, and please note uh, that the AHA's website is doing a migration and update this week. Uh, so we are waiting for that to be completed and resolved to work the kinks out and whatnot before we open registration uh, for the courses. And we anticipate doing so at the end of January. So stay tuned for that. And finally, we're very excited that our annual national conference featuring Team Steps will be this June 20th to the 22nd in sunny and warm San Diego, very excited for that, um, at the Manchester Grand Hyatt. Uh, in fact, our speaker today, Dr. Nunes, will be uh, speaking at this conference, so if you like what you hear uh, today, uh, think about coming to the conference. We'll be opening registration in the next few weeks, along with some pre-conference workshops that will happen uh, uh, before the main conference begins. So keep an eye out for that announcement as well. Um, here's our contact information. So please don't hesitate to email or call us with any questions related to Team Steps or any of the events or courses we have. And again, our website is going through an update, so please keep that in mind if you see something unusual as we migrate over and work out some of the kinks. Um, so enough of me. I'd like to turn this webinar over to Dr. John Nunes who we've now known for several, several years, I believe. Uh, we met him at uh, the National Conference, and him and his colleagues have been speaking nearly every year, uh, I'd say for the last four or five years. Uh, John is the Chief Safety and Quality Officer at St. Charles Health System and is a wonderful Team Steps champion, uh, so I know you all will be in great hands during his presentation. So, John, I will turn it over to you. So good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Um, thanks uh, for taking this hour out of your time to uh, discuss with me something I'm very passionate about, which is patient safety. 
So there were some questions sent ahead of the um, webinar, so I'll attempt to answer those throughout the presentation. I'll, after the presentation, I really like the question and answer period because there's a lot of expertise on the line, and the more we can discuss ideas, uh, the better uh, we can make our, our patients uh, safe. I spend a lot of my time in the world of physician engagement, and I want to just tell you a little bit about where I'm currently at and, and a little of my background so you know who's speaking with you today. And so some of the objectives today are really how physicians view patient safety uh, and how team steps can be integrated into their dynamic of patient safety, and then how do we develop true physician champions. And then once identifying those champions, how do we speak to them um, in a relevant communication style? And we're going to talk a little bit of how a conversation with a doctor who may be in the baby boomer generation is a little different than one, uh, one of your physicians who may be in generation, generation X, or generation Y. And we're going to talk about the differences in the engagement strategy. And so we're really going to focus today on physician and leadership engagement. And so to start, um, I want to tell you a little bit about where I'm currently at. Um, St. Charles Health System is in Central Oregon. Our main level three hospital is in Bend, Oregon. Uh, we have two critical access hospitals in Madras and Prineville and a community hospital in, in Redmond, Oregon. Um, many of uh, you are undergoing significant transformational change as we um, go through uh, this phase of healthcare. So I just wanted to point out that um, Joe Sluka, our current CEO, has put us through a lean transformation, but I wanted to point out that quality and safety are two of our True North metrics, and so we have a strong commitment um, to this area. And so um, I show you this to uh, start defining the world that our physicians find themselves in. And so through 2015-16, we did a lot of rapid improvement events, a lot of lean uh, type of transformation, and we are now in the middle of, as many of you may be, in an epic or some type of EMR transformation. Many of the questions that were sent to me were around technology and EMRs, but we are right in the middle of epic and going live uh, in early April. So my personal journey, very briefly, I uh, had a long history of military team training and saw uh, dynamics of how you could still have decision-making hierarchy, but yet a respectful uh, team environment. Uh, a little contrast to what I saw when I um, came out in the early 90s into the civilian sector. Um, significant part of my career was a labor's program development, using team steps after a catalytic event. And I'm going to talk about Sentinel events and catalytic events and how they can be used as maybe your jumping point into a, a, a culture of safety and a just culture, which is something that many physicians really have not found to be present in their work environment. Um, and then um, the critical um, step for me, and as, as Jen recently talked to you about, you have to form, in my opinion, a close-knit group to help you sustain and develop the will whether it is team steps you're rolling out or just culture work with your physician community, when you meet that resistance, you have to have a group of five or six people in that effort to sustain each other and to keep the will and the desire um, for whatever project you're rolling out, in this case, um, safety uh, type of programs or team steps. So, Having presented at the Team Steps National Conference, and uh, Jen and I were recently at the University of Illinois, these are the most frequently asked questions for me. You can talk about all the tools for a couple hours or a couple days, and invariably, where are the doctors, and are the doctors required to take this course? And the bulk of what um, our teams are being asked to do is how do I get my doctors in the room and more importantly how do I get them to lead the safety efforts and the team dynamic changes that we're trying to do so this is really in my experience with team steps now coming on almost nine years is the involvement of nursing and physician leadership at the highest levels and so 
I saw this picture and I said, you know, I think anybody who's trying to involve physicians in whatever they're trying to change, and we're going to talk about how physicians may not see the need to change. And so that's why um, you get this type of dynamic. And so let's just briefly go over physicians resistant to safety measures. As we all know in the quality world, sometimes good hard data is hard to find. And especially if your conversations involving surgeons and the attestation of a complication, take that as an example, if anything on the quality data isn't solid and we use that in our conversation, they're going to distrust the rest of that conversation. And so you're, you're, the physicians being defined as an expert culture, they frequently use self-reliance above data or self-reliance above a process as their default position for patient safety. So especially in your surgical specialists, their individual competency is what they feel is their safety net. They rarely um, rely on others or team processes um, to um, increase their, their safety, whether it be an operating room, an emergency room, or an obstetrical suite. We're going to talk a little bit about um, getting them to see the need for change. Physicians are very slow to accept change in general, and we're going to talk again about the intergenerational differences uh, as far as the pace of acceptance of change. And so I'm going to talk just briefly about the dynamics that physicians may see themselves in, regardless of their generational status. And I got a lot of uh, questions about um, physician burnout and how team steps can be used in it almost as a prevention to that. Physicians are, are sensing a significant loss of autonomy, the protection of their, their environment. They see themselves in a world of overwhelming demand with hospital systems contracting resources. And then, if you're undergoing implementation of an EMR, that creates significant disruption to their workflow. Many of, of physicians now are also becoming employed for various reasons, and the reality of being an employee affects their sense of control and autonomy, making, making the interface with them more difficult if you're approaching it from a quality and safety standpoint or team steps, because it's one more thing in a world that's ever changing for them. As we roll out a team steps culture, which, which we're going to tie into a culture of safety and just culture type work, the position you may be in, in, engaging is used to a failed accountability model where sentinel events were evaluated by the old style of a root cause analysis with assignment of blame and then a performance improvement plan. So the resistance, especially in your older physicians, comes from a history that is not really set towards improvement, but more importantly, not set towards the consoling of a team and a coaching of the team, which is all components of a just culture. So their defenses may be higher until we can develop some trust with them. So as I said, the rollout of an EMR I think is significant in healthcare, and you're starting to see truly if an electronic medical record adds the safety uh, that people were hoping for. And there's no question that it will provide a part of the safety net of notification. Uh, it would be much better at collection of data. But what you're finding is that caregivers are frequently at computer screens where the nurses are documenting, the physicians are documenting, and they're not doing other than the, the morning brief or a huddle or a debrief if they've got good team step concepts in place. We've lost the human conversation and connection. And so as these EMRs get implemented, which help us create a safety net from a technology standpoint, and they do add to that environment, I think it makes team steps um, more important from the human aspects of patient safety. I'm a very strong believer that patient safety truly lives in the relationship of the caregiver team. I, I think the computer can help us. And there were several questions about how can I implement team steps if all I've got is four minutes at the, at the huddle board or four minutes at the morning brief. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, styles you can use for tool implementation um, in the middle of larger events that you might be having. 
This um, picture that you see on the, your screen was on my desk when I was the chief medical officer of St. Charles Medical Group. And it was just uh, something I'd pulled out of a magazine and it disappeared from my desk and I just assumed I had thrown it out. And it appeared about three weeks later, um, our head of family medicine had taken it and then said that I was markedly um, short in the amount of things that your physicians are thinking about on a daily basis. And if you have time to review the slides, each one of these circles is, could be a significant stressor um, to, a, to a physician. So when we bring forth team steps or a quality or safety project, it's one more thing. In our world, it's the most important thing, uh, but we have to realize the receiver of, of this information. And so when you look at physicians in general, and, and I guess I've lived in the world of surgical specialists, I only show you this slide to point out that there's not a lot of team training in the development of certain physician specialties. If you go to most medical schools now today, and, and thank goodness, there's team training and simulation. Many medical schools have elaborate simulation labs to, to really teach what I consider the ultimate team sport. Some of your baby boomer doctors are used to a career of competition, individual competency, individual performance, and so their conversation is going to be different than a new um, physician to your medical staff who is very comfortable with team dynamics. This is a great article by Martin McCary. It, it, it's really in Teamworks in the Eye of the Beholder. And it's a great study to show that as we go to our surgeons or go to our ED doctors and say, you know, we really need to work on our teamwork, they may not see the need for change. This is a great article about uh, looking at how a surgeon felt, anesthesiologist, nursing, the OR tech, and you see a prompt decline in the perception of teamwork. And we all know that AHRQ has some great tools to gauge uh, people's perception of teamwork. But a surgeon, if, if asked, may feel that his or her room has amazing teamwork. And if everyone simply listens to what I'm saying and we does it in a prompt and efficient manner, it's going, everything's going to turn out fine. So in certain team members, a hierarchy of orders cascading down, they may perceive that as, as excellent teamwork. And so the need for team training or, or ideas of empowerment and contribution of the entire team uh, to them may not seem necessary. So again, the beginning of the conversation may be simply to demonstrate the need because they truly might not see it. So when you look at team training, many of you are familiar with the slides, I think it's really important that you would think healthcare would be the ultimate team sport from its very beginnings, but in reality, um, as you can see, that team steps has not been a around a long time, and you still can go to medical meetings and, and they d discuss the air is human report. Almost in any safety talk of the 44,000 to 98,000 <coughs> of medical error deaths, and it, it's extremely old data, so I want to give you some newer data today as you set that burning platform for some of that physician resistance you might be seeing. And so I think you, you have to get into a mindset of selling it because it may not be obvious to who you're trying to, to get the need across to. So really a high-performing team creates a safety net. So in our world, we do a lot of culture of safety, a lot of umbrella of culture of safety work, and we tie team steps into that. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. This slide is one of my favorite slides. This is a complete paradigm shift for many physicians, um, from self-advocacy, self-improvement, to a mutually supportive team environment. You'll find that when you start rolling out a lot of simulation, you can get those physicians finally into the simulation environment with some team steps tools. They frequently ask, how did I do? They rarely ask, how did the team do? How did our measurements come out? They're just used to the individual performance model. and so. Uh, we've been very um, vigorous in incorporating simulation because it brings the team steps principles off the page, and I think physicians like the um, combination of simulation with, um, with the team steps principles. 
And so again, um, a few slides into this talk, I finally have the Team Steps logo. Um, this logo is in our operating room. It's in our labor and delivery suite. It's anywhere that we've rolled Team Steps out. Um, especially with your physician community, if you have larger events and courses that you're rolling out Team Steps, there's got to be almost a weekly or daily type of sustainment plan because with all their conflicting priorities, it falls off uh, their radar pretty quickly. And so a big part, as we talked about, of our culture of safety um, is respect. Uh, we have specific programs around instituting respect back into the workplace, support, the mutual supporting, but more importantly also celebration of victory, something I underestimated early on in Team Steps rollout, uh, as well as working with our younger physicians have to celebrate and appreciate the things that are done well with acknowledgement. Um, it was a piece that I, I wasn't used to in my early career, uh, but is really critical now in team dynamics where they're doing so many things that when we do have a win and low-hanging fruit is accomplished, that we stop for a minute and, and recognize that. This is um, part of the RESPECT um, program that we rolled out um, at St. Charles. Uh, we, our team went to IHI and did some work, and we did a lot of work around respect because as a lean transformation organization, respect for people is one of the two pillars. And we came up with recognize patient safety concerns, evaluate, then of course, stopping the line, empowerment and partnership. And at the end of it, the courage to challenge the status quo, and then hopefully over time with our physicians, we'll develop trust that they trust that true leadership is a, a team that respects and trusts you, not a team that is afraid of you. And I want to use this slide to bring up a quick point about stopping the line. It's really important that we educate our physician community, our, our nursing leadership community, on how to behave and how to, to get used to somebody stopping the line. Um, when a caregiver does stop the line, um, usually a physician is being stopped or a physician is just being asked to clarify. Certain physicians have never been asked to clarify or never been asked to discuss with the team a patient care plan. And I found myself doing emergency meetings with physicians during the stopping the line dynamics. So if one of the tools you're rolling out is empowerment of caregivers, if they feel their safety or the safety of the patient is a concern and they're using the CUS tool or a stopping the line type tool that we prepare those being stopped to at least either call the safety or quality team or the culture of safety team uh, to at least help in that dynamic because it can, uh, to put it bluntly, it can kind of go south pretty quickly. So I'll give you just um, a second to uh, read this cartoon. So as, as I, when I, when I use this um, cartoon in most of my uh, talks, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with it is say, you know, uh, for the physician community, we're not challenging your authority or decision making. Sometimes people confuse empowerment, collaboration, and how the patient benefits from that dynamic. Sometimes certain physicians will perceive it as a loss of control or a loss of that autonomy that I talked about. And in reality, it only potentiates that when the respect can flow into the team. And it's, as you've all known, when trust really forms on that team, then the physician realizes what he or she was doing before is nothing compared to the team dynamic they have now. But if you're, if you're dealing with physicians, you're going to have a day when, so does anyone else feel their needs aren't being met? because the neonatologist feels we don't understand, the cardiac surgeon feels we don't understand. So this slide is to remind us all that you need a close-knit group of people. And I like five or six that truly can, usually have gone to Team Steps training or Jen and I have gone to their organization. You have to form those five or six people that are so passionate about it that no matter what resistance they're getting, they realize they're on the right track. And, and so you, you're going to find that 
in my team, Gina or Elgin or my other teammates would lift me up if I was feeling that I was on this cartoon, depending on the day. This slide is not, um, so we talked a little bit of where physicians are. This is actually American healthcare. This is not, this is not a cartoon. Uh, my CEO gave this to me at a CEO conference that he, from a CEO conference he had gone to. Patients down here, physicians, CMS, you all recognize the, the acronyms. It's a complicated environment that we're delivering healthcare, and it starts at the very top. And we can have a whole other discussion about why it is so complicated. But again, it just adds to the ever-changing shiny balls that our providers have to, have to see every day. And so these two books, I'm sure, are all on your shelves. To Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chiasm and started this movement in 1999, but there's so much more that's come from that that you can use with your physicians because they've heard the Air is Human for so long, it, it doesn't really register for them. And so if you look at where we are today, um, Dr. James has done a lot of work with the IHI Global Trigger Tool uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about his personal story in just a minute. But he estimated it, we're probably, uh, premature deaths are about 400,000. And serious harm is probably 10 to 20 times more common than that. And we're going to talk about his journey on the next slide. But I recently went through a joint commission um, inspection about a month ago. And I was touring with one of our inspectors, and he asked me, how many wrong site surgeries do you think we have in the United States? Well, having known that, I said, we have 40 a week. He goes, you're the only one that's known it's 40 a week. He goes, can you believe it's that many? And I said, well, most of them are regional blocks. Most of them are not, a, you know, most of them are not all significant in the sense of what someone would think of as a wrong side surgery, but one is too many. And we talked about why that is, and I'm going to talk about when you roll out timeout strategies to uh, physicians and how we, we didn't do a good job of that in the beginning of rolling out timeout strategies and universal protocols, and that's why we didn't notice a drop in this number when, when it was first rolled out. This is Dr. James's son, and this is a great book uh, to read. His son um, was killed by a medical error, uh, the potassium sign on the side. He had relative hypokalemia and a prolonged QT interval, a discharge summary by a resident dictated the wrong diagnosis and wrong action plan, so his outpatient cardiologist did the exact wrong thing for a prolonged QT interval, and while running, he collapsed and unfortunately died. Dr. James is a NASA scientist who now dedicates his work to patient safety, and this is a great book to read um, about medical errors, and he started the movement, really, that the number is maybe higher than we think, um, and so um, it, it may not be this high, but you've all seen this article where Dr. McCary came uh, and published in the British Medical Journal that it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. And he has some excellent numbers to put it around 250, um, still an incredibly high number. And so when you're dealing with your physician engagement, if you can show them data from other physicians, he happens to be a surgeon, show them the uh, book, um, I'm blanking on the title by the retired Kaiser CEO uh, recently um, mistreated, and they understand data. They understand that there may be a significant issue. Frequently when you come up against physician resistance about, say, you're discussing wrong site surgery and timeout protocols, and you know, you'll frequently hear, well, I've never had a wrong site surgery, so I've never had that. I've never had a meta error that killed a patient. So we have to show a burning platform. So how do we do that? How do we show that there's a need to change? And so when I was a resident, the mortality rate was under 9 per 100,000 live births. This is an old slide. It's now 23. And when you look at a slide like this and you show an obstetrician in the United States a slide like this, once you prove it's accurate data, and this is from... Jamie Orlikoff, and I have his permission to use this slide. There's many reasons why the United States has the rising rate that it does, but you, as a physician, and again, as we talk about our physician community and nursing leadership community, they want to do the right thing for the patients. Even the most difficult, the most resistant, the most passionate against team training, they want to do what's right for the patient. And when they're treated um, 
when they're treated uh, with good data and shown these things, they do tend to pay attention. And so uh, Jen and I were at the University of Illinois recently and uh, showed this slide. And I believe while we were there, someone said that base jumping is 30 times safer than being a Medicaid patient in the United States. Now, I don't know if it's 30 times higher, but no one would think that the picture on the left is unsafe but they sure would think the picture on the right is something they probably would never do. So I want to do a comparison here and take just, just two minutes. Um, this is Ms. Barr, the CEO and president of General Motors. And that's that ignition switch that about 12 years ago was blamed for 33 deaths. And over the course of the next decade, uh, probably 150 deaths. Uh, were attributed somehow to that ignition switch. And she's in front of the Congress of the United States taking full responsibility and said that a series of benign neglectful mistakes had catastrophic consequence. Three billion dollars in recalls, 75 million National Transportation Safety Board uh, in fines. So I look at a number of 150 over a decade and she's in front of the Congress of the United States. And then I look at my own profession and some of the numbers that I see, regardless of the complexity and the reasons for it, and I sort of wonder, where's the outrage? And I think we do have outrage. We just don't know what to do with that. And we definitely have a burning platform, and this is a picture of a burning platform. And the key to physician engagement is to make them understand that there is a burning platform. And due to some of the reasons I talked about in the, in the presentation, they may not see it. It may not have affected their career. Physicians tend to think of the patient in front of them. While many of you are thinking about surgical services to your community, your surgeon's thinking about the appendectomy in front of him or her. So they tend not to engage in wider sweeping conversations. And so when you come out and you're in an expert culture, uh, you tend to think you've got it. And I think John Wooden said, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. And I think that many physicians, once they can be engaged, uh, will use that same passion um, that they've had in their specialties. Don't ever underestimate the competitive nature of physicians, and don't ever underestimate that they want to do the right thing. And so if you're going to any talks these days, Eric Hoffer, an American philosopher, uh, his quote is gaining new steam, and it's, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists. And I think physicians are at this precipice. I think with EMRs, with what's occurring in healthcare, the high complexity rates, employment, we've got to get them to learn a different way We've got to learn to give them a little different, give them different tools that they've never had before because they've maybe never needed them before. Um, and that's why you're seeing physician suicide, burnout rates, and numbers equal in nursing leadership uh, that are just uh, a little frightening. And so I, I said I would talk a little bit about uh, culture of safety. The little arrows are what we've done in quality and safety for a long time. And we've done very little team training. And again, as I talked about, in my opinion, the ultimate team sport, finally in education, is getting team-type training with simulation, communication techniques. Um, and so in our culture of safety work we're doing at St. Charles, we um, are keeping team steps alive with contracting resources and, can, and um, using simulation to keep it a little more um, enjoyable and palatable. A recent example is massive transfusion protocol, very popular thing to simulate. As EPIC comes into our world, we're simulating the EPIC workflow with massive transfusion. And so I want to just speak briefly. This is an IHI slide. Culture of safety we, is a whole um, almost course in itself. But to me, I show this slide whenever I can. It's no one is ever hesitant to speak up. Then, as leadership, we listen, and then we tell you what we did about the concern you brought forward. In the world of physician engagement, they absolutely don't trust this dynamic because they rarely report into our safety alert system 
and they, or our event management system because they don't trust it. And in the past, they've had bad experiences where 10 years ago, they never heard back. So sometimes physician engagement involves um, getting them to trust, simply reporting their concerns. And so instead of quality and safety interface always being usually about disruptive behavior or a sentinel event, it becomes, tell us your concerns, can we remove those barriers? And then, by the way, I want to talk to you about team training. I want to talk to you about a better way of doing a surgical timeout. So create this, uh, I'm not going to read the slide for you, but JAMA said this in 2005, creating a culture of safety in many physician communities may be seen simply as a threat, a threat to their autonomy and authority. And I think there's very few people on this phone call that are looking at, at autonomy, are looking at authority, they're looking at better communication techniques so that teams talk to one another. Because I said earlier, I'm a really strong believer after doing uh, OBGYN for 37 years and still being clinically active, I believe patient safety lives in human relationships. And I believe the value of team steps is as teams get to know one another as people, they're more likely to communicate, more likely to pass on critical information when I look at all the sentinel events and all the catalytic events, it's, it always boils down to the communication and that human relationship is at least one of the root causes, and that's where Team Steps becomes critical. And so I want to go briefly through uh, position resistance. These are various things I've heard over the years, um, and I didn't sort of make these up. Um, didn't we just do this? Uh, this is the actual position table. Um, sheet that that I that I copied for this slide. Um, show me the data. How, am I hurting anyone? A week after this, we lost a patient in the ED due to a significant catalytic event that made national news. And I want to talk briefly about catalytic events or sentinel events and how it can be the beginning of physician engagement to begin a conversation around just culture and not failed accountability. So they're going to be part of our environments. If you just look at the numbers of 250,000, unfortunately, we still live in the world of events that need to be looked at. I strongly feel it can be the beginning of change. If you have a physician or an advanced caregiver or a nursing leader that doesn't deeply care about patients, that's a whole other conversation. Most of the doctors we do, the doctors I deal with and nursing leaders, they care deeply about the patient. It can be the beginning of developing trust when you sit down and have a different type of root cause analysis process, and we've just implemented a new one here, that's based on truly consoling the team and then coaching behavior, and then truly the smallest part of punishing persistent, reckless behavior. And again, based on behavior, not outcome. If someone, if a physician is reckless and there's not a bad outcome, that's still is something that Team Steps can help with and, and in a just culture environment needs to be dealt with. Two things I really want to talk about and, and, and turn focus to physician engagement. Promise in these, in these times only what you can deliver. If you have a physician community that's not trusting, don't promise the world and then don't deliver it because then it becomes the next story in their disappointment. So out of an event, if you just say, well, we're going to order this in the operating room as one small part of what happened in this particular conversation, and then deliver that, and then celebrate that you delivered that. The second thing is when I am rolling out team steps or new team, team training, I choose current position leaders. When you're going up against resistance and you're going into an operating room environment or an ED environment or an obstetrical environment, I wouldn't pick the new doctor. I wouldn't pick him or her to be the physician champion on that team. They may have a lot of enthusiasm, but when you're trying that initial push into a resistant environment, I would use physicians or advanced caregivers who have an impeccable clinical reputation, who have a, um, a standing in the medical community. Um, you can pick the newer physician but they're going to need a lot of mentoring and support from that core team of people that I, that I talked about. And so uh, 
This is um, Buzz Aldrin. Neil Armstrong was taking took this photo, and it's called the price of doing great things. And I and I remember this slide always reminds me that when Neil Armstrong was asked would he go to the moon, uh, he said, "I wouldn't take a million dollars not to have gone, but I won't give you a dime to go again." Passed away, I believe, four or five years ago, and and didn't do a, and really disappeared from public life. Uh, I think I, I tell you this that. I truly think that when you're doing this type of work and incorporating team steps uh, into, say, a catalyt post-catalytic event, the consoling of the team using team steps tools is the real beginning of that process with physician leadership. And then we'll get to the, cap the um, coaching behavior later. So just remember uh, the importance of um, team steps in the consoling part of, of just culture development. So I'm, a, I'm very passionate about whether you're rolling out Lean, whether you're rolling out Six Sigma, whether you're rolling, whatever you're rolling out in a care environment, it's not going to take hold unless you've got team steps principles of communication. If you roll out, say for instance, sign out protocols, and the physician community is saying, well, I have not needed a sign-out protocol, whether it's I-PASS the baton or whether it's SBAR, and you're getting that resistance. We've got to push through that resistance because anything we roll out is not going to, fit, is not going to be take root because if we don't have buy-in of the physician community, they're going to, I'll just use the word, they're going to undermine the implementation until it almost is, is non-existent. And so, so how do we do this? How do we um, how do we get into an expert culture that's worried about autonomy, worried about control, worried about their authority? Dr. Rogers did a lot of work in 1995, and it's still true today. You have to find the two to three percent of critical mass physicians. You don't. You're not going to go into the Department of Surgery and get buy-in from the 22 surgeons you're looking at. You have to find two or three that truly, with the help of your engagement team, can, can feels passionate enough to do this. Then they're, going to, then they're going to approach early adopters. And remember I talked about going for the small victory and the, and the competitive nature of physicians. We had an organization that was doing the timeout process beginning in the pre-op area before patient sedation. Every surgeon took note of why is that patient getting that level of attention and my patients are not. And you say, oh, would you like to hear about the patient involvement in our pre-op process universal protocol? Physicians wish to be included. They're very competitive in certain environments. And if we can get enough innovators and early adopters and not try to fix the entire peri-op medical home, you'll find that it starts to take a little root and go and simply go for the small victory. If you're, the thing I've noticed about physician engagement, whether they attend the meetings or not, is that they were asked to attend the meetings. And they were given notice and multiple meeting opportunities, include them very early, make them very aware of the times with plenty of advance notice. Now they may not come, one or two may come, but the effort needs to be made to include them early on. The, you've all been in meetings where if they sense that the decision has been made, and they're just simply being notified, whether it's true or not, if their perception is, oh, so this meeting is to notify me of the new timeout policy or the new CUS tool that we're rolling out in the operating room, if they get a hint of that, true or not, that's where that conversation starts to go. And so the earlier they can be asked to attend, or at least given the opportunity, the better. And so just some small points about physician engagement. We talked about picking the proper audience. You have to pick the right physicians in that area. Very, you have to be very careful to make promises that we don't deliver on. I'll give you an example. If you ask a cardiac surgeon what color should we paint the lounge and he or she says yellow and we decide we're going to go with blue, they're going to feel we had a contract. You asked me what I thought. I told you that color. You want another color. So it adds to their perception that they weren't heard. So frequently lead with what do you think, what, do you, what are your thoughts, so they're very clear that 
it's, we're not asking them to make that decision, which they're very comfortable doing, then we can develop that trust um, with that community. Another interesting aspect of physician engagement is that um, you might have to remove the barrier really quickly. So in other words, if something is a barrier and they keep talking about it and you can't get past it, remove the barrier. Whatever that is, fix that issue and, and move on. Because you'll go into this, and they're still talking about some equipment piece. I tend to remove barriers so it's just off the table. And again, appeal to the right thing. Never underestimate the competitive nature of docs. And so again, sell the need for change. When you empower your caregivers, be sure to do some stop the line education. Um, it's important to get their attention. So Jen, we could keep going, but should we open it up to questions? What do you I think? How much time do we have? Um, we have about, I'd say, seven or eight minutes. Great. And so we can well, ask keep going. questions. Just, just let me know when to stop, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to talk briefly about a uh, respect required program that I was involved in when this is a Rolls-Royce symbol that we used. Um, there's a lot out in the literature right now about prioritizing psychological safety. People have to feel psychologically safe to report the near miss. And if your teams are not psychologically safe, they're not going, you're only going to find out what they can't hide. So when you look at team steps dynamics, they really not only foster communication, especially in the communication, they're, they're starting to hopefully prioritize psychological safety, that people feel comfortable speaking. And I want to talk about a, that in the surgical timeout realm just briefly, so I can give you some specific tools. When we rolled out surgical timeout, it didn't affect wrong site surgery, and people couldn't figure out why. Surgeons perceived it as a direct threat to their autonomy. I don't need someone to verify my surgery that I'm about to do. You were hearing things like, you've known the patient 10 minutes, I've known the patient for 10 years, this is what we're doing today. What they, when we started rolling out timeouts and, and did things such as everyone speaking at the timeout, because studies have shown if that scrub tech has spoken at the timeout, asked a personal question about their kids, they're more likely to speak up during the case to maybe show the surgeon where the bleeding's coming from or have a suggestion. If you tie in your circulator, you tie in your, your people, your anesthesiologist. So my timeout starts in the pre-op area. Everyone speaks and everyone does part of the timeout. Because the purpose of the timeout, as you guys all know, is to create that team, to create the shared mental model, to create that safety net that the patient then benefits from. Whereas physicians, when we first rolled it out, thought it was simply to verify the surgery site, and they saw it as a double check just to them. So if you ask Henry Ford, it wasn't really a nice man who really created the middle class, that if you've asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for a better horse. They wouldn't have asked for um, a car. So change management, which is a big, I consider team steps really a component of change management and change for obviously for the, the better. Um, sometimes selling the simple need to change is the challenge, not selling um, team steps. Um, and George Bush made the mistake of landing on this aircraft carrier and saying that mission was accomplished um, anyone who's been doing this work, and I know all of you are aware about, of this, physician engagement takes years of time to develop trust with them, just like an aircraft carrier takes several miles of open ocean to turn around. As you start to turn around your aircraft carrier, you've got to have that core team to sustain momentum. So I want to talk um, briefly about physician engagement in, in depending on what setting you're in. If you're in a large tertiary hospital, you're going to come up against a lot of inter-office politics, minimal physician and input into quality assurance. There's a distrust by physicians. In these large quality departments, data is in many different pockets, so getting solid data is critical when you're trying to engage your physician community to demonstrate the need for team training, for instance, improved sign-outs. As we all know, when a patient transfers care, that's the most dangerous time to sell to, to sell the need for change and to sell the need for communication improvement, for team dynamic improvement, um, data is absolutely critical when you look at errors 
that are created in patient transfer. A critical access hospital or a smaller hospital, you've got to be really careful about autonomy. You have to respect the local authority and get their buy-in and actually help them launch the program. To come into a small hospital, which may have 10 or 12 physicians or 20 physicians, and then come in and, and launch a program, again, it's more critical to get the buy-in of your lead physicians and have them launch uh, the program um, and almost co-teach in certain times. Personal autonomy is very highly valued in your smaller hospitals. So before I quit, I want to um, talk about intergenerational workforce and then we'll open it up to, to the questions. Um, there's a lot of different generations in your physician community. Um, a lot of different animals in, in that. So a conversation with a cardiovascular surgeon is different than a family practitioner, different than an anesthesiologist. So you have to sort of realize the receptor of the information and tailor um, the information. A cardiovascular surgeon is going to want data. A pediatrician may want different type of data. And so let's talk about baby boomers just briefly. There's a lot of books out there about physician uh, communities now, very strong work, work ethic, careers of vocation, very high value on autonomy. They have a false belief that patient safety is only in their individual ability. And they have a what uh, Mr. Nance goes on ABC News after every uh, event of, a, of the airline industry and says that if hypervigilance is your safety plan, you're going to fail. These guys, these um, men and women rely on hypervigilance. They can be strong resistors, but the good news is you can appeal to their personal ambition and competitiveness. So this is Rob Ross. That's me on the right. Rob Ross is our head of family medicine, a classic baby boomer physician. If you can turn him from the dark side, and I feel I've done this, he becomes your best ally. If you can convince him that this is the right thing to do and work with him, once he believes it, he now Six months into it, Team Steps was actually something he brought to the organization. So baby boomers take more to get moving, um, but appeal, appeal to their personal ambition. Jen Laughlin, the head of our hospitalist program, is more of a Generation X, Generation Y position. Um, high value on work-life balance. Very open to team concepts. Um, they're less hierarchical in their thinking. The challenge for us with this community of physicians is they require more coaching and mentoring for sustainment. Um, they're more of not a convincing, they tend to be an easy buy-in, and they're not, new concepts aren't as big a threat to their autonomy. Um, the issue is if you schedule a five o'clock meeting, they're probably not in the hospital. And so you have to, I, I say that a little jokingly, but you need to work with their work-life balance, which may be healthier than Dr. Ross's, but you have to um, work with that dynamic with, with your coaching and mentoring. So we've talked a lot about this. When I deal with physician communities and I'm rolling out team steps, I just talk about patient safety. And there's a lot in the, in the literature now, and it's on the HRQ website about true clinical improvement when you incorporate team training and team dynamics, especially with simulation. So it's never a bad idea to simply start bedside backwards. We're not questioning autonomy and control down to the patient. Let's talk about the bedside and then go backwards to the team that takes care of that patient. And this will all end with this. There's more on disruptive behavior and open up to questions. In the first one to two years of physician engagement, they're waiting for you to go away. And the reason they're waiting for you to go away is they always go away. So a, a, a doctor of 18 years has seen administrations come and go. They've seen ideas come and go. So if they just wait long enough, there's going to be a new idea. It's when at year three to five, when all of a sudden team steps isn't going away, they keep bringing up this cuss mnemonic. They keep talking about handoffs. They're talking about universal protocol. That's when team steps becomes critical to an organization, and that's when resistance has to have more of a structure. So I want to talk about some techniques I've used because uh, I had cut, got a couple questions on this. I do hold events. There are events that are scheduled. So 
recently down at Stanford Valley Care, Sunny, an ICU director, scheduled an evening event with dinner with Bocce as the team training event, and we did some lectures during dinner. Going off-site is respectful to the people coming, and it says that this is important. So I do do events that involve some team building, um, and the physicians attended. We, I think we had four or five, which is a good number for the first rollout, because it said this is important, and we gave them three or four months lead time. But to some of the other questions, I do have, if the huddle board's all you've got in the morning, I would go over a tool. And if you've got your hospitalists that are going on and off or your laborers that are going on and off, they hear about stopping the line or whatever tool you're doing for the month. So I found a combination of events with courses, but then there's got to be that daily tool or sustainment effort uh, with every three month maybe an event or a couple hours at a staffing meeting. So you've got to have a multi-prong approach so that docs see that you're not going away. So Jen, I think we'll open it up. Yeah, I think we have time for one or two questions. So we might okay. I might need to get a, a quick response on some of these. Okay, so I went over. So you're saying no, I went okay. over. Um, <laughs> Going back to uh, kind of the generational focus on engaging physicians, um, Jacqueline asked this question that basically said, so, you know, more and more younger physicians are coming out of medical school with a bit of background about on team steps. So yeah. how would you suggest the, I guess, relationship or interaction between the younger generation of physicians who are very eager and excited to implement team steps? and then they might get denied by that baby boomer generation. So how do you suggest that those two groups work together, the tactics for that relationship to continue with team steps? So here's, here's, here's a really quick answer. The surgical specialists don't have the experience coming out of training, and they always ask about a surgical mentor. So when I was chief medical officer of the medical group, I assigned a mentor from the baby boomer generation to the younger docs. They were actually assigned in a mentor. And to one of the other questions I got, I did compensate the mentor for their time. Um, so I actually made it a formal relationship of check-in. And so the baby boomer actually um, got a benefit from, from team type dynamics from the younger physician. And then they got their feet under them by the mentorship of the of the older surgeon or the older internist. So I formalized the relationship, actually. Every new doc that got hired got a mentor. That's a great idea. Um, thanks for that. And unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of people's time. But John, thanks so much for, for speaking today. Um, I think you did a great job of, of sending out the message that just like team steps implementation, physician engagement isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach um, due to varying factors. So it's really taking into account, you know, uh, different factors such as their generation, whether they're employed or not, um, those, types of, those types of things. So thank you for your insights, and thank you everyone who joined today. Uh, just a reminder that you'll receive um, a an evaluation that will be sent to your email, so please fill that out because we really do like to take a look at that and see what we can continue um, doing well that's, that's going great and what we can improve on. And then additionally, we'll send a follow-up email with some of the, uh, the resources that John mentioned in his presentation along with the recording of this once it has been posted. So again, thank you all for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, this conference has now concluded. You may disconnect your phone lines and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.